chapter 3 of the Bhagavad Gita is very pertinent to the debate over Grihastha versus Sannyasa Ashram. So in the first two texts of chapter 3, Arjuna asks Krishna to clarify whether philosophy, which is, which means giving up all actions, which means sannyas, and just studying and just meditating, whether that kind of philosophy is better than karma or activity, action, which is the Grihastha Ashram. So he says, you say that intelligence is more important than action, but then you push me into terrible actions. This is a confusing contradiction, so please answer clearly. What is better for me, action or philosophy? So now here comes Krishna's answer in text 3. He says, I did not say that intelligence is more important than action. I said that you must synthesize the two paths the science of philosophy and the practicality of action. So Krishna is saying that the two have to work together, renunciation and action, and that they shouldn't be seen as opposing things. They should be seen as two stages of development. But in the fourth and fifth texts, Arjuna has a question and Krishna has an answer. Arjuna says, why should I synthesize them? If philosophy is more sublime than action, why shouldn't I dedicate myself to it completely? You hear that all the time, don't you? Spiritual life is way more important than material life, so you should just completely give up your material life and 100% take to spiritual life. Um, so Arjuna is asking a similar question. And Krishna says, to completely dedicate yourself to philosophy, you must put it into practice. True philosophy is not inactive, it is practical. No one becomes truly wise or free from worldliness by just sitting around doing nothing. Anyway, it's impossible to truly do nothing. No one can pass a single moment without doing something. Everyone is helplessly forced to act at every moment by their very nature. Now Arjuna has a doubt. What about the hermits who live in the forest or in caves? They seem to be doing nothing. Krishna, everyone knows they are pretenders. Mithyachara suchate. They pretend to be doing nothing, but they are quite active beneath the surface. In other words, they keep their senses artificially repressed, but their minds reminisce on sense objects. So Arjuna said, well, wait, if renunciation is better than attachment to sense objects, then why should I synthesize the two? Why shouldn't I just take renunciation and abandon sense objects? And Krishna says, because real renunciation is not to just abandon sense objects, but real renunciation, real wisdom is to use sense objects wisely. And... Uh, he, he makes the point that you can't just become wise by throwing everything away and doing nothing. And Arjuna says, well, what about these hermits and cave dwellers and renunciates who seem to be doing nothing? Krishna says they're pretenders. The people who, who pretend to give up sense objects, they just think about, they just want them, and then they act for them in strange ways, in perverse ways. They keep their senses artificially repressed, but their minds reminisce on sense objects. So Arjuna has a nice question up at text 7. He wants to know, how can we avoid being a pretender? So Krishna says, it is possible to truly control the senses, but real sense control begins by freeing your mind from selfishness, which is only accomplished after using your senses intelligently. Using the senses intelligently is far better 
than making a show of giving up the world. So he says renunciation is possible, but it's only possible after you've been freed from selfishness. And the only way to become freed from selfishness is to engage in activities which engage you in sense activity for the sake of others, dutiful activities, responsible activities, not giving up activities, but doing activities responsibly and dutifully. It frees you from selfishness without denying you from activity, so you don't freak out from being cold turkey denied from activities. But you're not acting on a selfish platform, on a platform of lust and personal gratification because you're working for the sake of others in a responsible way. So this is better than trying to stop all activities. Using the senses intelligently is far better than making a show of giving up the world. So Arjuna text 8 says, but how can I use the senses intelligently unless I first cultivate intelligence? Catch 22. You say that if I use the senses intelligently, I'll develop intelligence. <laughs> but how do I get this intelligence to use the senses intelligently? So Krishna says, at first you can borrow intelligence from the scriptures by doing your duties responsibly. So you follow the responsibilities given to you in the scriptures because at first you don't have intelligence, so you borrow it. So at first you can borrow intelligence from the scriptures by doing your duties responsibly. That is the beginning of intelligent action. It is certainly better than trying to stop all activities. If you give up your activities, you won't even be able to keep your body functioning properly. So what is the Grihasta Ashram? It's a way of responsibly engaging in a regular life in the world, not selfishly engaging in it. It's a way of interacting with people and, and work and uh, responsibilities in a way which is not in completely selfish but which serves others. That is what the scripture recommends for people between certain ages. Then in the next group of texts, Arjuna asks an interesting question that, well, I get some side benefits from doing my duty. It might be enjoyable. Is, is that okay? It might be personal and enjoyable. Like, I may be serving my family, but I may also be in, enjoying that. Is that all right? And Krishna says, of course, that's, that's natural. As a result of duty, there will be happiness. Then it it comes up to the 20th text. So by the 20th text, Arjuna's gotten this idea correct that Krishna is saying that responsible duty will elevate you to the platform where you're free from selfishness and then you're able to actually renounce without being a pretender. So now Arjuna has a question. What if a person is already spiritually evolved? Would they still carefully perform their duties and perf uh, perform their worldly responsibilities? So his question is, what if I'm already at that level, or if, what if somebody's already at that level that they're free from selfishness? Should they then be encouraged to completely renounce life? Krishna says they don't have to do such duties, but in most cases they would. And Arjuna, of course, wants to know why. So Krishna says they would do it for the sake of illustrating the right path for others to follow. Whatever great people do, Common people imitate whatever examples they set. The world adopts. So at text 26, Arjuna has another interesting question. Why don't the wise just teach philosophy to the foolish? Why don't the wise teach the fool some spiritual, inspirational knowledge that will let them come to the level of being totally selfless and totally give up all material life? Why don't they do that instead of setting the example of how to gradually purify yourself? Krishna says, text 26, how will a fool understand philosophy? The wise know better than to confuse them with impractical theories and concepts. Instead, they set an example that encourages people to pursue their precious desires in a more moral, dutiful, and spiritually progressive way. So that's the essence of the third chapter there, and as you can see, it's quite relevant to um, the discussion of whether or not the sannyas type of lifestyle or the grihasta type of lifestyle is more appropriate for people at large. Hare Krishna. Thank you.
Thank you.